Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I take great pleasure in bringing to you one of the greatest, one of the world's greatest gospel singers and guitar virtuoso, the inimitable Sister Rosetta Thorpe. In the summer of 1964, in the pouring rain from a disused railway station outside Manchester, a 49-year-old African-American woman with an electric guitar appeared on British television. Viewers had never seen anything quite like it. With her distinctive style of singing and playing, this remarkable performer would profoundly influence the course of popular music. You know it did, didn't it? Oh, oh, yes, how it rained. I said it rained, children. Rain, oh, yes, didn't it? Yes, didn't it? You know it did, didn't it? Oh, my Lord, how it rained. She had a guitar that was made of steel, and it was loud. And she would just get on this one drink and start banging on it, and, and look, the people would go crazy. She could play a guitar like nobody else. Nobody. I think Rosetta was a hugely important figure. Let's it. You know, she was really unique as a guitar player. She had a big influence on somebody like Chuck Berry, who was one of the most influential guitar players in the world. She did an incredible picking. That's what really attracted Elvis was uh, her picking, and he liked her singing too, but he liked that picking first <laughs> uh, because it was so different. Don't you know now this train is a clean train? Everybody ride it in Jesus' name because this train is a clean train. Oh, this train. She had a major impact on artists like Elvis Presley. When you see Elvis Presley, singing um, early songs in his career, I think if you imagine that he is channeling Rosetta Tharp, it's not an image that I think we're used to thinking about when we think about rock and roll history. We don't think about the black woman behind the young white man. All the kids who grew up in the 40s and 50s knew of her as a superstar. And so I think it's very fair to say that there's a bit of her snuck up in all of rock and roll. Sister Rosetta Tharp was born close by the mighty Mississippi on March 20th, 1915, in Cotton Plant, Arkansas. Parents, Katie Bell and Willis Atkins, were cotton pickers. We don't know too much about Rosetta's father. What we do know about the father is that Willis 
Atkins could sing, and so it's possible that some of her gift of singing came from her father. Her mother um, was an evangelist for the Church of God in Christ. Her mother was incredibly passionate about the church. Rosetta's mother, Miss Katie Bell, was what we called her. She was a very traditional person, and basically she was what, what we called a stomp-down Christian. I mean, that's one that enjoyed stamping her feet and patting her hands and celebrating what she believes in. And the reason that I think that Rosetta really became such a strong woman was because of her mother. Because her mother, again, was the same type of person. She had no fear. She would take her guitar, she would take her tambourine, she would take her chair, and she would sit outside and play for people and try to convert them and to get them to go to church. In 1921, Katie Bell left Rosetta's father to become a traveling evangelist for the Church of God in Christ. Taking the six-year-old Rosetta, she left Cotton Plant and joined the exodus of poor black southerners heading north. There was work in the great city of Chicago, and also something even more crucial for the young Rosetta. The migrants brought the blues from the Mississippi Delta and jazz from New Orleans. Rosetta is often seen as a country singer, but that's a fallacy. Her major development occurred very early. She moved to Chicago when she was six. She and Mother Bell joined Robert's Temple Church of God in Christ and the Chicago Sanctified Church was bubbling with musicians and new songs. And so she was exposed to something that was new. It was not rural, it was an urban kind of religious singing. It was at that church where she first really started performing, um, where she was the main attraction. There's a great story that has her being put when she's six years old on the top of the piano, um, holding a guitar, being put there so that she could be seen by the congregation and playing and singing and charming everyone with her talent and her precociousness. There's something within me that just holding the rain. She told me that That's when she was a girl, not even 10, she was immediately seen as an all-purpose musician. She'd go to a revival, and she play her guitar. And if the people would get happy afterward and shout, she would drop the guitar and run to the piano and accompany them with her piano chords. And then she might get up and cut a couple of dance steps herself. She was a phenomenal showwoman. On life battlefield, when without pleading, my poor heart did heal. All I can say, Praise God, there's something within. All through her teens, Rosetta was taken by her mother from city to city to perform in churches, tabernacles, and revival meetings, winning the hearts of thousands with her demure looks, angelic voice, and unique guitar style. Oh, have you that something? She soon became a nationwide celebrity within the church. And this Philadelphia church is one of the first she performed in, back in the 1930s. Those who heard the young Rosetta were inspired for life. When I saw Rosetta, I was, a, I was about maybe 10 years old. Oh, she had, she had the most beautiful voice and the way she could speak to you. It made you feel different. You knew something was going on, even if you didn't understand really what it was. And that's the way it was with me because I was a child. Many 
of the hymns were expression of suffering and wanting to survive, many of them. And when she came and they saw the expression of her, the freedom that she expressed in her singing and dancing, it woke up the congregation. It focused them on something that was on the inside that they never gave expression to. Rosetta would start looking up. She didn't look at anybody. She looked up as if she saw God. And it, as if God was in her and she was communing with him rather than with a human being. In 1934, when Rosetta was just 19, her mother married her off to a preacher, the Reverend Tommy Tharp. For the next four years, she and Tommy worked for the Church of God in Christ. Her job was to draw the crowds while he preached from the pulpit. But in spite of her mother's good intentions, the marriage was not working out. Look up! Look up! And see your maker before Gabriel. I met Sister Rosetta in the summer of 1937. She seemed a little bit glad that she was married, but she didn't seem to be very happy. And that's the reason I took to her, because, you know, I wanted to just make her happy, make her feel as special as she really was. But I didn't have any idea that she and Tommy wouldn't make it. He was a tyrant, um, from what my parents used to say and talk about. Uh, he seemed to... Um, come out of the real, real sub old school and believed in the kind of almost caveman-like attitude towards women. I found that he really wanted her because he figured they could use her to make money to help him make a living, and that's the truth. I, I hate to say that, but uh, that's the way it turned out to be. She was just a meal ticket. She was a performer, and he used her to bring people to his churches, and he would put her up to sing. And after a few years, she had enough, and she said, you know what, I'm going to leave all of it. And she made that big jump. Let down by the first of several men in her life, Rosetta left her husband and took her mother to New York to forge a new life for herself. My husband and I, we separated a little later too. So she said, well, sister, why don't you come to New York and stay with me and mama for a little while until you decide what you want to do? So I did, I went there. We would sit up all night long and sing and she'd pick the guitar softly and we'd both sit up there and cry. <laughs> <laughs> we would cry because, you know, we didn't know where we were going from there. In a city full of nightclubs, Rosetta's talent was soon noticed. She was offered a spot at the prestigious Cotton Club, singing to an upmarket white audience. But the song she was given by the men in charge made no mention of God just pleasing her man. Four or five times, four or five times, it's my delight to swing things right four or five times. Now, baby, I'll try, and baby, I'll try, but if I'll die, I'm going to try to do it four or five times. I said four or five times, four or five times. Now, he's my king, and he makes me sing four or five times. Yes, indeed. I confess, he kills the best. It was like a bomb had dropped on gospel music when she flipped. <laughs> it, it was like, what? You know, I can't believe she's, that's Sister Rosetta Tharp. She's not supposed to be singing that kind of music. Oh, she was criticized 
and ostracized. I mean, the church people just, you know, just thought that she had just gone way off. Actually, it was hurtful to a lot of people because they felt as though they had lost something. They had something and it was great, but now it's gone. And they, they viewed it almost like a death. You know, Rosetta is, she's gone. She went over. She's in like another world. But having discovered that she loved God and nightclubs, Rosetta decided to sing gospel in church and join the secular world of show business. No longer the good little girl from church, she was happy to defy convention. The offers poured in. She was wanted by all the big bands of the day. She decided to go with the band leader, Lucky Millinder, and manager, Mo Gale. In October 1938, she signed a contract with Decca Records, which was keen to capitalize on the novelty of a gospel singer with a racy new style. This was not the path that her devoted mother, Katie Bell, had chosen, but she stuck by her daughter. Her first hit was a song called Rock Me. And the, the lyric is, Jesus hear me praying. She sang, won't you hear me praying? So when, when she came to the chorus, when she sang, rock me, and growled, rock, it sounded really, to many people, like uh, an invitation and not to the altar. Recording the song in that particular way marked her as someone who was having the nerve to reinterpret a spiritual song for a secular audience. I think there was also a piece of her that was just rebellious. She does some very risque material with Lucky Millinder, most notably a song called Tall Skinny Papa, which was a big hit for Millinder's band, and she was the lead singer on that. And she sings, I want a tall skinny papa. There's no way of <laughs> misinterpreting I want a tall skinny papa for anything that has to do with um, spirituality. The next thing I heard was this recording out a Rosetta with the tall, skinny papa. So I said, it can't be Rosetta. So I went and bought the record. And after I listened to it, I said, oh my goodness, sister's out there singing that stuff. So when I, I saw her, I said, sister, I heard you tell Lucky Millinder that you weren't going to sing that stuff. She said, when I saw that contract, he had a clause in there that I had to sing whatever he gave me to sing. She said, and I didn't know it and I had a seven-year contract with him. She said, and I had to do it. It's unclear, I think, how much agency she had in making a recording like Tall Skinny Papa. Uh, she was under contractual obligations to Lucky Millinder. She was a young woman without a lot of experience um, in show business. She may not have been very comfortable with that material. Nevertheless, it's on record, and it was big hit. Following the controversy of Tall Skinny Papa, Rosetta resolved to stick with the songs she knew best, gospel songs, while giving them her unique, upbeat interpretation. Look down, that's 
She had hit the big time. Her loyal followers back in the church got over the shock and stayed with her, while she gained new fans who just loved her music. It was not an easy trick to pull off, but somehow she did it. She could go there and come back anytime she wanted to because people loved her and they loved her no matter what she sang. They loved her. By the age of 25, Rosetta was rated among the finest popular musicians of the day. Here she is jamming with Duke Ellington at the piano and Cap Calloway on the right. In less than five years, she had established herself in a tough male-dominated industry, singing the songs she chose to sing in her own distinctive way. She was rich, she was famous, and she was loved by her fans. She was gospel's first superstar. She used to sing this song called The Fishes and Three Loaves of Bread. And every, anywhere you went down in the South, it was on the radio. That was a big hit. Throughout the 40s, she spent much of her time on the road, playing to packed houses, accompanied by different gospel quartets. The Dixie Hummingbirds started with Sister Rosetta in the 40s. They never made records together, but they toured. And uh, Sister Rosetta was always the headliner because it was her show, and she had the choices of picking who she wanted to go out with her. And for many years, she chose the Dixie Hummingbirds. It was a very good mix. Uh, people enjoyed the styles because her style was kind of fiery with the guitar, and uh, the hummingbirds would come out, and then uh, they would jump down in the audience and start singing and, and, and really relating to the people. So it was a good mix, and promoters loved it because it always filled houses. Sometimes we do things we've never done, just playing, just playing around with it and tell each other, that sounds good. Let's try that again. And that's the way we created a lot of stuff, you know. In a highly segregated society, black and white musicians performing together was taboo. However, Rosetta was happy to defy convention. She was more or less a pioneer in asking us to even to perform with her. She called us her, her four little white babies. And I thought it was so cute that, you know, that she referred to us as that, as, as that way. I thought that was just something I'll never forget. And we just loved to sing with her because when she started snapping her finger, man, and started singing on a tune, you couldn't help but sing. I know the first time we worked with her, they, they booked us. We went, to the, we went to the stage door and some man came to the door and, uh, and we, one of us said, well, we are, we are the Jordanaires. And he said, hmm, you, you are the Jordanaires? Well, he said, this is gonna be a surprise to our audience. Sister Rosetta didn't tell him that we were white. <laughs> she booked us, but she didn't tell him we were white. And it, it, when we first went out on the stage, they didn't really know how to take us, but then we started singing, working on the building. And then on then we were in. Throughout World War II, America's segregated black soldiers not only adored Rosetta, but could claim her as one of their own. 
And now we want you all cats to brush up your fur and be seated while we dish out a dinner and a dig down dante right out from under auntie. And here's a gal who's going to do the chirping for you. Sister Rose out of farm. Sister Tharp, say hello to Joe way, way out there. Hello, Joe, way, way out there. <laughs> and what are you going to sing, sister? Down by the riverside. <laughs> No films of Rosetta performing traditional gospel songs during the 40s exist today. But this 60s television recording captures the powerful stage presence and unique guitar style that she had developed back in her heyday. Everything she had learned from her mother, everything she had learned from growing up in the sanctified church had stayed with her. She was mesmerizing. My sister and I thought she was the greatest because we had never met a popular singer, and only gospel singers. And we saw Rosetta Thorpe playing the guitar and singing. We thought that was the greatest thing we had ever seen in our lives. The audiences that Sister Rosetta performed in front of were average people. They were people who worked, people who were trying to better themselves, and this music was their inspiration. So when it came to a show that brought in people like Rosetta Tharp, and there were lines three and four times around the block. Just to call her name, people would go crazy. And the people just really loved her. All she had to do was walk out on stage, but they knew they were going to get a good performance. And before she left there, the public was part of her, and she was part of the public. And it was like family. <laughs> Rosetta had a one-on-one -on -one with everybody. I mean, there could be eight, nine hundred thousand people, but she had a one-on-one -on -one with you because she could make that music and make that guitar talk just like, like you were there with her, like you helped to write the song. I want to meet all of my brother. The biggest hit in Rosetta's entire career was Strange Things Happening Every Day, a song that reflected some of the stark contradictions of the times. All we hear church people say, they are in this holy way, there are strange things happening every day. It was recorded at the end of the war, when prosperity and freedom were being proclaimed as the right of all Americans. The song expressed some of the sad ironies she was experiencing on the road. She was a star, but she was also black. Every day. Sister Rosetta had a bus. She was the first person that ever had a bus with her name on the side of it that I knew. In the back section was beds to sleep in. And that was always uh, something that I thought was really very unusual. We couldn't stay in some hotels. We had to sleep on the bus, so the bus was really a good idea. 
Being on the road with Sister Rosetta was very exciting because sometimes we met opposition and sometimes we met gladness. Food and, and hotels, restaurants, all of this, were, they were all the same. Uh, water fountains, bathrooms, everything was segregated. They had to, as my father used to say, make do. Jesus is the holy light, turning darkness in We would go in and eat, and we knew that she didn't have food on the bus, you know, or maybe she had crackers or cheese or you know, peanut butter or something like that. But uh, we would we would go we would take the, what we ordered, we would get her the same thing, and uh, and take it to her. Oh, every day, every day, yes, every day. Sometimes you found someone that took a chance and said, "Come around to the back door," and they would serve us. But uh, we had to bring it back to the bus. Still, we couldn't eat it there. Up above my head, up above my head, I hear music in the air. I hear music in the air. Now up above my head, up above my head. By the age of 30, Rosetta had survived two brief and unhappy marriages and had had numerous affairs with men and women. The only constant person in her life was still her mother, Katie Bell. However, in the spring of 1946, she encountered a young singer called Marie Knight. So impressed by her, she suggested they team up. And together they recorded a hugely popular version of the gospel classic, Up Above My Head. One of the things that made Marie and Rosetta so special as performers is that they were two women who could go on the road without any accompaniment but themselves. Marie was a piano player and percussion player. Um, Rosetta performed on the piano as well as the guitar. And so the two of them together had their entire band with them. Up above my head. Marie Knight and Sister Rosetta Tharp were a perfect pair. The music was so wonderful that they generated together. They were so unified on a stage. Together, they could rock the house. Back then, two women on the road together without any men to accompany them was not only novel, but pretty risky. But it was a risk that Rosetta was prepared to take. They were lovers at least according to many, many of their friends at the time. Within certain circles, they could probably be a little bit open about it, but obviously within the wider world, that would have ruined careers, it would have ruined reputations. But I think it was an open secret in the entertainment worlds in which they moved. In 1950, while Rosetta and Marie were performing in California, Marie's mother and two small children were killed in a fire. Traumatized by the loss, Marie drifted away, leaving Rosetta to carry on alone. Their dream of independence together was over. Less than a year after breaking up with Marie, Rosetta took the most outrageous decision of her life when two concert promoters came up with an audacious publicity stunt. Their plan was to stage Rosetta's third wedding in Washington's huge Griffith Stadium. They would sell tickets to her fans and the recording rights to Decca. Rosetta agreed to go along with the plan. But there was just one problem. She had no one in mind to marry. But just weeks before the big day, 
she found Russell Morrison, a minor player in the music industry who offered to be both her third husband and her manager. Tell the truth, I was surprised when she said she was getting married <laughs> and Russell was going to be the groom. <laughs> so she records uh, her wedding ceremony and a concert that follows it in 1951. 25,000 people come out and pay admission prices to attend her wedding. They bring wedding gifts for her, they bring crystal, they bring um, dishes for her, someone even buys her a television set. It's a total showbiz move. And at the same time, it's a, it's a wedding ceremony um, conducted by a minister, a real wedding ceremony. Rosetta was standing on the pitcher's mound and they had everybody around her and all of the matrons of honor and all these other people who were probably folks that the promoters got together. But they were all there, and, and it, was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful show. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to Griffith Stadium, where you're about to be guests at the wedding of Sister Rosetta Tharp, after which there'll be a great spiritual concert followed by fireworks. And it was nice to see that a lot of her friends had stuck with her and were part of the wedding party. Lucky Millinder is there, Marie Knight is there, and the Rosettes are there. That stadium was packed. You know, somebody said it's a fake. It was packed. I don't see how they could get anybody else in. It was like a circus. <laughs> Rosetta, will you have this man to be thy wedded husband? To live after God's audience in the holy states of a matrimony? I mean, it, it resonated throughout the entire country. Every, it was in newspapers, people talked about it. My parents were so excited about it. They were, I mean, for a month in my house before that wedding was just crazy. Take him by his right hand, Rosetta. Hold it. I, Rosetta. I, Rosetta. Take thee, Russell. Take thee, Russell. For my wedding. It was, it was like, um, she was Cinderella, you know? And Russell was Prince Charming. And it was a storybook thing. That they are man and wife. Kiss the bride. Man and wife. <laughs> I didn't go to sister's wedding to Russell. I just figured it was a, an, another something that she had gotten herself into. After meeting Russell, I figured that he just wanted an easy living. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, she's doing it again. <laughs> Touch an old his soul. So high can get over him. So low, so low he can get out of his so Sadly, the misgivings shared by Rosetta's friends proved all too accurate. While the wedding did boost her record sales briefly, Russell, the manager, was out of his depth. Russell just, like a cool breeze, just came right in, took over. He wasn't, a, he wasn't really a manager. He, he thought he was a manager. And of course, so many times when they think they are, they aren't. And uh, that's bad. It was very clear that he was living off her talent. And it was very clear that he was two-timing her. Many people, especially people close to her, like Marie Knight, were furious with him. In spite of all the criticism, Rosetta remained married to Russell for the next 22 years. Meanwhile, back in the Mississippi Delta of Rosetta's childhood, young white musicians were just beginning to discover the raw energy and complex rhythms of African-American gospel. There was a hip thing happening in Memphis at that time. There was a little church and it was cool, it was a cool thing to do on Sunday nights only. 
you would go there and there would be Elvis and some of the other guys from the area and it was unusual because back in those days white people had to sit in the back and it was roped off and we would sit back there and we would watch these black spiritual singers sing on Sunday night. Of course, this was the music that Sister Rosetta had brought out of the church and into the wider world nearly 20 years earlier. The thing that gospel spiritual music brought to popular music was feeling. Gospel spiritual music put the guts and the feeling and the real soul into it. And uh, people like Elvis and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis and Carl Perkins and those guys, Buddy Holly, if you will, they saw that and they adapted to that. And that really was the essence of rock and roll. Thinking about it, Sister Rosetta Tharp, she had this great feeling, and that's what Elvis was looking for, feeling, because that's what was, that's where it all came from. She gave a lot of people ideas of how to perform. She, the way she performed a song, the way she picked a song, the way she presented it, was, uh, was an inspiration to anybody who, who stood around and watched her, and they all watched her. kids who grew up in the 40s and 50s knew of her as a superstar. That was the singing that all these fellows had in their ears. The rhythm they heard, the instrumentation they heard would have been the sanctified piano and the kind of guitar that they knew from Rosetta's records. And so I think it's very fair to say that there's a bit of her snuck up in all of rock and roll. By the late 50s, rock and roll was here to stay. Its idols were young white men, not middle-aged black women. Rosetta, it seemed, was on her way out, and the bookings were drying up fast. She and Russell, along with her aging mother, were forced to move into this small row house in the city of Philadelphia. The reason Rosetta's career went south very simply is that Rosetta didn't keep up with the times. Rosetta was still singing in 1954-55 the songs she had recorded in 1938. In fact, it's remarkable that she kept any career going when she had really become essentially an oldies act. Then, in 1957, Rosetta got a call from one of her most devoted fans, a white musician in Britain. Chris Barber, the popular Dixieland star jazz trombonist, booked her to go on tour with him and his band for a month. We got our agent to contact her somehow, and they um, actually paid her to come to Britain. <laughs> it was very simple. And it was marvellous working with her. She was actually unbelievably good. And um, we learnt, as we thought we would, enormous amount from, from even the first day with her, never mind the, 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 whole, the whole month's tour. Basically speaking, her guitar by itself was as loud as my entire band. And it didn't bother anybody. It was beautiful music, it was loud, it didn't matter. It was, it was enthralling, totally enthralling. It was totally, totally enthralling and totally convincing. This train is a clean train, this train. 
I said this train is a clean train. Yes, this train. You know this train is a clean train. Everybody ride it in his name. And this train is a clean train. This train. This train has left the Booked as little more than a supporting novelty act, Sister Rosetta stole the show. Has left the station, yes, this train. Until now, British audiences had only seen white imitations of blues and gospel. But here, on stage, for the very first time, was the real thing. Her newfound popularity quickly caught the attention of bookers and promoters all across Europe. Sister Rosetta was a star reborn, discovering new fans. By the early 60s, her influence was continuing to spread as yet another generation fell under her spell. This train. Here is a recording of Bob the Dylan train. speaking about Rosetta on the radio. Sister Rosetta Thapp was anything but ordinary and plain. This train. She was a big, good-looking woman and divine, train. not to mention sublime and splendid. She was a powerful force of nature. A guitar playing, singing evangelist. It's a clean train. Everybody ride it if you can. You know, she traveled to England with Muddy Waters and a whole bunch of other blues performers in the early 60s. And I'm sure there are a lot of young English guys who picked up an electric guitar after getting a look at her. It's standing in the station. This train is waiting on all of you. Come on and let's go. This train. In the summer of 1964, Rosetta was booked by Granada Television to perform in a folk, blues and gospel special. The musicians were American, the audience English students, the venue a disused railway station Chalton come hardy just outside Manchester. The Manchester gig was a curiosity in the middle of the tour for us. It was kind of bizarre, but you know, we were all new to England and we were aware of all this interest in blues and gospel. We all thought it was strange, the setup with the audience on one platform and the musicians on the other. <laughs> And she rose to the occasion. She loved the drama of the situation and sort of trying to bridge that gap between the platforms and sell the whole thing across the, the track to the audience. By now, Rosetta was 49 years old and she had been on the road for more than 40 of those years. But even in cold, wet and windy England, the magic was still there. I take great pleasure and bring it to you, one of the greatest, one of the world's greatest gospel singers and guitar virtuoso, the inimitable Sister Rosetta Thorpe. Oh, the sweet horsey. Oh, this is the wonderful time of my life. And the people are so sweet to stay here. And I come in on a... Let me tell you what I come in on. Oh, yeah!
one more. But no crack out. Uh-uh, my friends. The angels got the key and you can't get in. I know it rain. You know it rain. Rain too long. All night long. Rain all day. Rain all night. Rain. Didn't it, yes, didn't it, you know it either, didn't it? Oh, my Lord, how it rains! Yeah. Rosetta was a huge success in the tour. I mean, she did great. Audiences loved her. She was very happy. Everybody was happy. Oh, I love you so, my English friends, forever and ever until I leave this world. While Rosetta was away in Europe, her mother was becoming increasingly frail. In 1968, Katie Bell died. For 53 years, she had stuck close by her daughter, through good times and bad, as the one constant figure reminding Rosetta of her faith in God. The loss took a heavy toll on Rosetta. She became increasingly depressed, and to make matters worse, she was diagnosed with diabetes. I'm going to sing a song that maybe you wouldn't understand it, and maybe you do. A song that I love so dearly. And I have so many friends here in Copenhagen. For many, many years I've been coming here. And then sometime my friends... Made in 1970 in Denmark, this is the last known recording of something Sister Rosetta performing. Maybe you wouldn't understand that, but someone died who they dearly love. And mine did too. My mother died two years ago and left me alone. But nevertheless, I have you. I went to see her, and she had this black spot on her foot. I said, Sister, what is that? And she said, I don't know. I said, Sister, go see about that, please. That arm hurt them. That's going to happen. But there is a divine power. I believe it. I don't know about you, but I got to believe it because I was raised that way. I sing this song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and let me stand. I'm tired, you don't work so hard. And I'm weak. My body is worn. Oh, 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 yes. But I got to go anyhow. Through the storm. She wouldn't listen to anybody. So the next thing, foot started turning black. Then she did have to go to the doctor. Then they found out they had to cut a leg off. Just to say. Sometimes she would call me and say, Sister, please come. Please come to see me. And I would say, All right, I'm coming. But the last few months I didn't go because, you know, Russell was acting like he didn't want nobody taking over from him. When I went over to see her and said, She was in the bed and she was, and she, she would say, Where's Russell? I said, Downstairs. And she would say, He's asking you about shows, right? And I said, no, he didn't say anything. He said, yes, he is. He, he wants to know if I'm going back. She said, and I'm going back, but I'm not going to tell anybody when I'm coming back, but I am coming back. But she never did. My body is all, all suffering in pain. I got no one to call on. Here I 
hear my cry, hear my call. Please hold my hand, lest I fall. Mm-hmm. Take my hand. Whoa, precious Lord. Will said his funeral was very quiet. It wasn't any big thing. It was no elaborate funeral, I can tell you that. The church was half full, and Rosetta looked the best I had seen her in years. Marie Knight, her old partner, she made Rosetta up. She took care of her coiffure, of her makeup, of, of how the fabrics looked and made her as glamorous as possible. She looked a star. I think I said she would sing until you cried. And then she would sing until you danced for joy. She kept the church alive and the saints rejoicing. Take my hand, oh, precious Lord, lead me on. In 2008, some 35 years after Rosetta's death, the governor of Pennsylvania declared that henceforth, the 11th of January will be known as Sister Rosetta Tharp Day. Up above my head. Up above my head. I hear music in the air. I hear music in the air. Now up above my head. Up above my head. Somewhere, heaven somewhere, up above.